Yeah. Well, good morning. Uh, listen, just to follow up with that video, if you are a veteran of any of the military services, uh, or if you have family members that are serving uh, and currently in the military service, would you please stand? We would love to say thank you. Thank you for all you and your family have done. And I, I, I would just like to, I would just like to add that may we just not applaud on, on the one day, but always remember these wonderful people that have served and that are serving. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you, you just bless them that have served, that you just continue to, to love them and, and, uh, and I know you are well pleased and that you protect those that are serving in the different capacities. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you notice, uh, these aren't veterans that, that have just come up here. But you are, uh, we are glad to have you today. It is, uh, it is our Orphan Sunday here at Canyon View, and we are glad that you're a part of it. Pastor Kirk's going to come up and tell you a little bit more. But we want to share the, the heart of God for the orphans. And, and right here are some previous orphans who are now in loving homes, and they're surrounded by family members. Would you do me a favor as Canyon View? Would you just tell them you love them with a round of applause? Yeah. And then the second thing I'd like you to do is I'd like you to stand because they're going to teach you some hand motions. We're going to do a song together. They've been working hard, and so I want you to lift up praise, encourage them, and sing along with them as we give praise to God.
Good job, you guys. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> what a blessing. Aren't they cute? They're so cute. Well, as they're heading out, just want to remind you that if you have children, uh, children's is going on, middle school and high school, so you're welcome to head on over if you uh, are of that age group or you have kids of that age group. Otherwise, we're going to continue on. It is good to see you guys. It is wonderful to see you. We've been in Israel, and, and uh, we've really enjoyed my wife and I. It's been, it's been such a blessing. One of the places we were at was uh, Mount Carmel, where uh, you've read the story. Some of you read the story of Elijah. And like I like to say it, he was throwing down with the prophets of Baal. And he's saying, my God is so mighty. My God is God. It's the only God. And so if, if you think you're your God, you gather it all together. Do whatever you want. Call your God, and we'll see if he shows up. And you know the sacrifice that he built. You can read about it in 1 Kings. And, of course, in the story, Elijah calls, calls down the power of God, and God shows his power. And so with that, it, it, I thought of this. I thought of the song, Our God, that we sing here all the time. But I'm wanting you to just to sing it as a prayer, that this is God. This, you, you are praising God. You're gathered in this room and in this place, but we're giving praise and acknowledging God. The line that's going to be your prayer, I think, that I feel that is spoken is, if our, if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against us? So I think that's a word for us as a church and we as a people. So when you sing that, I want you to sing it just not as, as a song, but I really want you to grab that for your life. Not just, on, not just on Sunday, but for your life, for your family members, for whoever it may be on your mind. That God is bigger than all things, and He is. He is God. Only God. To the darkness you shine Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, and our God is greater.
What could stand against if our God is for us? Then who could ever stop us? If our God is with us, what could stand against? Let that sear in our hearts, Lord. Nothing, nothing at all can stand against you, Lord. And those who are with you, Holy Spirit. Come to this place, Lord.
Let's do a little church. Come on. And Jesus. Just kidding, church. Calm down. You know, in Israel, and then even in the marriage retreat following, we came back and we're blessed to do the marriage retreat and do worship over in Israel. And the song we chose, it's an old song. It just really spoke to me, and I, I think I would really love us to do it here. It's really simple. But I want us to, I want us to, to just prepare ourselves for the message, and prepare what God has for us, to prepare our hearts, to prepare us to be a sanctuary, so to speak. And so uh, we're going to have the lyrics on the screen. If you don't know, it's really easy. You catch on to it. I'm just praying that God prepares us, that we come with expectation. Not only on Sundays, Lord, each and every day, but as we're gathered in here in this time, Lord, we, we want you to speak to us. Make us a sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a Lord, prepare to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Lift it up one more time. Lord, breathe to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanks. On that, have a seat. Have a seat. Amazing.
It is a blessing to be back. It is a blessing for us to be with you guys. We missed you. And thank all these wonderful people and all of you who serve here in and out every week. And, and uh, we, we were really blessed to be in Israel. Um, we were really blessed to be at the marriage retreat. Um, we were really blessed not to watch the Bronco Raider game. And I'll just leave it there. But overall, uh, we really, we really appreciate it. I got to tell you a cute story. And uh, when I was at the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall in Israel, there's cultures and people from every nation that come to Jerusalem. And I seen a guy with a Steeler shirt on, for you Steeler fans. So not knowing any language, I leaned over and I said, as American would, Steelers? And he said, yeah, I'm from Philly. So, and I said, oh, great, I'm a Raider fan, you know, and and we're going to go do a prayer at the Western Wall there, and I, you know, it's pretty cool. And he says, yes, you see this paper I have rolled up? I'm praying for the Steeler New England game. And so we walked up to the Wailing Wall, which this may be the only time we ever see it, and this football guy put a prayer for his football team. It brought me to tears, you guys. Brought me to tears. Anyway, ushers, come forward to receive today's tithing and giving. Lord, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love your people. I love your church. And God, I pray more of your presence in our lives. I pray that this offering that comes today that it continues to reach the streets of this community as it is in Kimbrough, God, as it is in the college and the backpacks and the many that are fed in the hut. Because of all these people, Lord, not because of Canaan Jews, but because of your people. Let your kingdom break through in this community in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Take a peek at the overview. How's it going? Tim Brown here. Here's what's happening at Canyon View. You know, people are always asking me, Tim, where do you find all the most up-to-date Christian literature? Well, I tell them right here. You can even check us out online. Check it out at www.connectionbookstore.com. With over 200,000 products available, plus download a $5 off coupon that you can use right here in the bookstore. And coming soon, ebooks. Check it out at connectionbookstore.com. We have one question for you How radical do you want to get? We have several possible mission opportunities available for the summer of 2012 England, Thailand, Puerto Vallarta, Japan, Uganda, and even Brazil. For more information, stop by the info desk in the lobby. Start planning and saving now. If you would like to provide a scholarship to bless someone else, contact Kim C. at gjvineyard.org. One more thing before we go. This week at Kaleo, our CD recording is happening. So we want all of you guys to attend November 16th here at Kaleo, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We want to pack this place out. It's going to be an awesome time of worship. That's it for this week. So if you have any other questions, you can check out our website at candyviewchurch.com. We'll see you next time.
Um, seriously, you, you left your lights on. So if that's you, then uh, we'll all applaud as you walk out and go turn off your lights. So I'm, uh, I'm breaking tradition today. As, as you can see, I'm not wearing my Japanese Hawaiian shirt. And I'm wearing actually a Chinese shirt from China. And this is what we bought. silk and so I only break it out for Orphan Weekend or the special deal and once a year for, th for those who know this once a year we, we really like to have a service that is just focused on answering the cry of the orphans and, and this is the Sunday that we do it and so as, as I share about this I, I wanted to start off with just kind of let you guys see a little bit picture of what's been happening and the, the last continues to be a champion to the church of challenging the church to respond to the cry of the orphans. And so at this conference, it was like the Lord was really speaking to him and that he's been you know, doing the right thing. And so then we, uh, we went to this, uh, this conference two weeks ago. Uh, Tim Mayer, Churches and 
Now, these are churches that aren't just growing in size and don't have great buildings. It, it, that's not about it because he says the traditional need, the model of making churches is, is, is how many people are in the seat, how, much, how big is their budget, and how nice a building is it. Yeah. He said that, that's not what we were looking for. What we were looking for was churches that are truly changing their community through their mission. And as he talked about this, uh, the three of us kept saying, you know, he's talking about Canyon View. And it was an incredible um, affirmation to us that, you know what, you guys are an amazing church. And the things that are happening here of how we're responding to the poor through uh, Kenwood and through the backpacks. And the biggest thing, you know what, is I believe that a number of you are getting it and you're really being missionaries. That you're going out to your jobs, you're going out to your friends, you're going out to your families, and you're just sharing the love of Christ with them. And, and so we're seeing life change all around. I also believe that Canyon View is being known in the community as a church that really cares about the community. And uh, I can just tell you story after story of, of people who don't come to this church, they know about Canyon View because of the things we do. That's transformational church. And so pat yourself on the back and say, way to go. Pat your neighbor on the back and say, way to go. And, and you know what? Uh, what I really, this is really my heart, is I never wanted to be a pastor. Actually, I never really wanted to be a pastor. <laughs> anyway, this is God's show. Any, so, but I never wanted to be a pastor of a church that just doesn't show the money. If that's all there is, to me, that's not worth dying for. You know what I mean? And I want to die for something that is worthy of something that is really bringing a transformation and transformation and transformation. And so the Lord really has really keyed me, given me confirmation that with our church, we're on the right path. And, and with this stuff that we've been dealing with with our daughter who is a baby. Now, I, I, I want you to know that many people who have never been in our in our shoes, what I'm talking about is is hard for you to comprehend, and and uh, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. But when you are working with a child that has a passion disorder, it really is it just drives you crazy. Nancy Thomas, the lady that we're partnering with, who uh, who is uh, support for our families that have adopted and um, even biological kids that have these issues. We're, we're building support around these families to help them to really bring healing in these kids' lives, that there's hope. And we are seeing an unbelievable change in our daughter, Bailey, in the last six months since we've been doing this intensive program. She's becoming a different person, and so are we. And so I, I and this is a great thing that the Lord really impressed on my heart is I talked to Nancy about this and I said, you know, Nancy, a concern that I have is um, the, the churches in America are really responding to this disease of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so pastors from around the country are, are telling their people, you know, the same things I'm going to be telling you, that there's all these orphans and there's all these kids in foster care and, and you guys need to respond to this and, and open up your homes to these kids. And there's this kind of this Christian sentiment that Oh, isn't that so sweet that you just love them and these kids, you just love them with the love of Jesus and they're just going to become beautiful people. But when you have a, a kid with attachment disorder in your home, eh -eh. It, it's a totally different story. And so I want to read you from this book of a guy who, who has a genuine heart for orphans. And I want to read you what he says here, because this is kind of the sentiment in the church. It says, I've always found this to be the best, most encouraging thing you can tell an orphan, that we're all adopted into the family of God, which is true. Followed up with a long hug, then a lifetime of caring and commitment so that they have a chance to become all that God created them to be. And everyone's thinking, you know that? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's where Jane and I were two years ago. That's where our heart was. And we, we were so excited to bring this girl into our home from Haiti. 
But you know what? When you bring a kid that has attachment disorder in your home, it's like hugging a porcupine. That they are so resistant to you and so res- because there's so much damage and there's so much hurt and pain in their lives that they put up all these walls around them to protect themselves. And so, you know, this is what's hard for people who don't understand this because we think just love them and pray for them and they're going to become beautiful people. We were trying that. And she was getting worse. Because this is where we don't understand. It's so counterintuitive. A kid who has attachment disorder, when we just try to smother them with love, what happens is they see you as weak. And they see you as someone that they can't trust. Because you're not strong enough to to control their life. You're not strong enough to protect them. And so they keep their wall up and they control their world and they control you in a way that they keep pushing you away. And so uh, Nancy Thomas calls this the the Chinese water torture. That especially a a person who was like Gertie is they're very passive aggressive in the things that they do to keep you at bay and you start feeling like you're a horrible parent. You start feeling like you're a failure. They start triangulating. They get other people that think she's just the most marvelous thing in the world, and they make us look like bad parents. And that's what was happening to us. And you know what? Families or couples who have attachment disorder kids in their home, the statistics are 74% of those couples end up in divorce because those kids are such, they're so incredibly bright and so manipulative that they will side with one parent over the other and they'll split the parents and they become divisive in the home. And so Jane and I were trying everything that we knew. We were trying to use natural logical consequences. We were reading the scripture. We'd pray over her and all these things. We think this is what we need to do to change her and it wasn't working. And so we found out about Nancy Thomas. And I, I really encourage you, if you have an interest in this, she has what's called the Purple Book. And, and it's called When Love is Not Enough. And she really helps you to understand the way these kids are. And, and I'm talking to a lot of uh, couples in this church that actually had an attachment disorder kid in their home, and their kid is now an adult that has attachment disorder. And when they hear this story, they go, that was us. That was our world. And what has happened in the process, as we have been investing very deeply into this therapeutic process with with Gertie and Gracie, actually, for the last eight months, is we're seeing movement and we're seeing change in her. And, uh, And I want you to know that this has been the hardest, most costly emotionally, mentally, physically, financially thing that Jane and I have ever invested in. I mean, it has just been a killer of a year, the past two years, actually. But we believe that God has a destiny for these two girls. I, I just want you to know that someday you're going to be reading about Gertie Yamaguchi or Grace Yamaguchi as they're running a small country someday. These girls are incredibly bright, they're incredibly strong, and they are learning to be responsible, respectful, and fun to be around in a way that I believe these two girls are going to be some of the best girls you're ever going to meet. I really do believe that. So it was, it was very encouraging for us because we also, Nancy introduced us to Deborah Haig, who is a, a specialist in doing attachment therapy. She lives in Dillon. So Deborah comes here every three weeks. She drives over the hill, and she spends three days here, and she's starting to do family therapy with our families that have brought these kids into their home that need help. And uh, so she met with a, a girls, the girls and Jane, and then she met with Jane and I, and she said, you know what? You guys are doing amazing work with these girls. And she's, she really sees how they're healing and 
how they're becoming respectful, responsible, and fun to be around. And she says, these girls are right on target. Keep doing what you're doing. So that was so affirming to Jane and I. And, and I want to thank a number of you guys in this church that have offered prayer support and, and support in so many ways to us. We couldn't have done it without you. But I want you to know is we have a number of families in this church. This is what they're dealing with. And they need you. And I, I want us to know that when a church responds to the cry of the orphan together, that all of us have something that we can do that will help uh, a life of a young child. The ramifications of this, the ripple effect of, of the lives that it can impact is beyond my comprehension. And, and there are a lot of things that we are working on right now that, that we will unfold to you as, as they, they come about that is going to be so exciting. It, uh, it, for example, of this, uh, this, we're making a video series with Nancy Thomas that we want to give to churches, to, in particular to pastors, saying if you have families in your church that have adopted, you need to know this information. I want pastors to be informed. So that when people come to them and they have a kid in their home that has these issues, they don't say, well, just go see a therapist. Because traditional therapy with these kids actually makes them worse. Because a therapist will tend to work with the kid individually and then work with the parents and sometimes together. And what that kid does is they are so good about manipulating the therapist to see that the parents are the problem. So the, the therapist sides with the kid against the parents, and they just make the kid sicker. You understand what I'm saying? So we need to have more resources for these families so that these kids that are being brought into homes can be helped and can really be given hope that they can totally be healed and made whole and complete people. Because that's the gospel. God is about bringing healing and restoration in every life that's in this room. Do you know that? And so that includes the orphans. And this is one of the things that I think that we are trying to be more realistic yet hopeful with families that are bringing these kids into their homes. We actually met a couple uh, last year, and we saw them this year at the Convoy of Hope thing, and they work for Convoy of Hope, and they're adopting a four-year-old girl from Haiti. And so they go, oh, we're so excited. See, we want to talk to you about our adoption of this girl. That We started the paperwork, and I went, oh, we need to talk. <laughs> so we got together with them, and, I, and we said, you know, we, we don't want to burst your bubble, but you need to know what we've been dealing with. And we talked to them about these issues with attachment disorder in, in particular, these kids coming from Haiti because it's such a harsh environment. And we said, we don't want to scare you, but you need to be prepared. Read Nancy Thomas's book. Get the supports around you. Get the respite providers ready and get them trained so that when you bring this girl into your home and into your church, even train your church that this is what these kids need. They don't need gifts. They don't need clothes. What they need is structure. They need people that are giving them exactly what they need so that they can heal. Okay? So that's kind of the process that we've been on, and, and God has just really confirmed to Jane and I over the last three weeks, you guys stay the course. You're doing the right thing. So as we talk about adoption. The one thing we need to understand is this isn't a religious thing. This isn't something that, okay, if we're going to be a good Christian, we need to help the orphans. So sign up. This is really a heart thing. And what, I, what I'm praying for today is that you will hear God's heart. And, and as you hear God's heart, that you will respond as the Spirit of God leads you. And one thing that I, I want you to know is that what this Woven Families ministry has done, and by the way, the person leading this ministry 
is the most amazing woman in the world because she has to deal with me every day, <laughs> is my wife, Jane Yamaguchi. And she has done an amazing job with this. This is typical of our life. I come up with the ideas. She comes up with all the work <laughs> to make it happen. But Jane has done a great job getting this team together. To You'll see the different booths in the back and, and out in the lobby. This is through all of the work that she's orchestrated with the leadership team from Woven Families. But I, I love what's happening because this is God's heart. And that, that's what we got to hear in this. And I, I'm, I started to read this little book called Letters by a Modern Mystic by Fr- Frank Laubach. It's the book of the month. And I read this, this line. This guy was a missionary in the Philippines. And he was working in the South Philippines in the 1930s with a Muslim people group. And he, he began to become very discouraged because he wasn't really seeing any fruit in his ministry of, you know, seeing conversions. And so he just started investing and spending time with Jesus. And as he spent time with Jesus, he wrote to his son, and this is what he came up with, and, and I thought this is, like, unbelievable. He said, they must see God in me, and I must see God in them. Not to change the name of their religion, but to take them by the hand and say, come, Let's go see God. You know, that's been our life. As we brought Gracie into our home five years ago, and now Gertie two years ago, every day we're taking these girls by the hand, and we're saying, hey, let's go see God together. And you know what? We're seeing God in a whole new way that we would have never seen without them. Because what God has done through these girls is revealed a lot of the darkness of the soul within us. I wish I could tell you how many times, if you look at my journals, you you can see where I'm going, oh, Lord, forgive me. I'm so selfish. Oh, I just am thinking of only me. You know, because this is what's happening through this, is, is God's refining us through them. It's, it's, have you ever been in a refining process? that you have to go in the fire for that. And when you're in the fire, that's when the dross is able to rise up to the top and the Lord scrapes it off. That's exactly what the Lord's been doing in us, that I am seeing things in my own heart that I didn't even know were there. And I'm not going to tell you any details (laughs) because it ain't pretty. But just know that God's using these girls to refine me just as much as he's using us to bring healing in their life. And without them in our life, I don't believe that this area of of my heart would have been challenged so much. And I'm thankful for that. And so the passion of my life always has been, whoever is willing, let's grab hands together and let's go find God together. But I never knew that this is the way it would have been with these two girls. So the question is, what does this have to do with orphans? It has everything to do with it. Because God wants to change every one of our hearts. And I believe that this this is not any theology, this is just my perspective. One of the reasons that God uses orphans in the world is to change the church. I, I believe that when churches start responding to the cry of the orphans like this, the Lord's kind of starts smiling on us, they say, now you're starting to get it. You're starting to see my heart for these kids. You read the scriptures that we saw in that video, all these scriptures about what God says of how to answer to the cry of the orphans, that that's what authentic faith really is. And so if we want to be authentic followers of Jesus, one of the things Jesus says is now then respond to the answer, the cry of these orphans, because they're my kids. If, if you ever read Heaven is for Real, where this little boy gets taken up to heaven and sits on Jesus' lap, he comes back and he keeps telling his dad, who's a pastor, Dad, Jesus told me to tell you he really loves the children. He kept saying, Dad, love the children. And I think that's God's heart. 
And I'm very passionate about this because I really do believe that, that God loves these kids and he wants us to love them in a practical way. And that's why I believe this one year that, that we are challenged the church to respond to the cry of the orphan is so important for you as well as for me because God transforms our heart. And so we've heard the statistics, some estimates that there are 142 to 210 million orphans in the world. There are 330 million people in the U.S. So it's, it's very plausible that the orphans in the world could occupy half of the United States population. That kind of gives you perspective of how many of these kids that are fatherless and motherless are out there. That kids that age out of the system, out of foster care, are, are the doors and orphanage are opened up, and they say, good luck, because they have no supports. A very high percentage of them end up either dead, in human trafficking, as hardened criminals, or in prison. That video we sh showed in the announcement last week, if, if you weren't here, it, it's, it's unbelievable. It's a, it's a, it's a live video of, that's on YouTube of a two-year-old girl who gets run over in China, and nobody helped her. That 18 people walked by and just ignored her. And, and the point was, are we going to continue to walk on by the plight of these orphan kids and not do anything? We, we've got to understand that there is something that God is doing in the church that when the church begins to respond to these needs of these kids, that I believe that his spirit is going to move in a greater way in the churches that are doing that because it's a part of his heart. So I asked Jane to do uh, kind of an guesstimates of our church in the past four years because when I first did this Orphan Sunday four years ago, I set out this goal so I want to see 100 kids adopted or in foster homes in our church in the next two years. And it's four years later. And Jane said that, We've had approximately 20 kids in foster care in the past four years. Uh, 50 kids have been adopted. And eight kids right now are in waiting to go into their homes. That They're in various places like Korea, China, Haiti, and, and domestically. So that's, that's 78 kids that have been impacted by the response of families in this church. So as we, as we talk about this, the, the one thing that we need to understand is God challenges us in ways that surprise us. When we went to that Stephen Curtis Chapman concert six years ago, and, and he started talking about these orphans, and, and I just started to weep. It was because the Spirit of God just, just fell on me, and God gave me his heart for the plight of these kids. I praying that God is going to speak to a number of you today. And one of the things that we need to understand is, is, uh, is God wants all of us. You know, some of us think that if I just kind of do the obligatory thing to God and, and give a little bit of money and, and go to church one a while, once in a while, you know, okay, God, we're good. But what Jesus says is he wants everything. He wants us all in. And he showed this in the parable to the rich young man who came to Jesus. This guy is very religious and very wealthy. Um, and he comes to Jesus and say, a Teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus looks at him and says, Well, you, you know the law. What does it say? And, and the guy says, Well, what are the laws that are most important? And, and Jesus says, Well... You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbors yourself. These are from the Ten Commandments, right? And the young man says, well, dude, I got that. I've done all of those. And he goes, he should have, he should have stopped right there. And sometimes I always go, why did I ask the Lord that? And he goes, is there anything else, Lord? He goes, God, I'm doing pretty good. And the Lord goes, hmm, you know, there is one more thing, buddy. And he says, here it is. He says, go sell all you have 
and give to the poor. Oh, the Lord nailed them. And how much does the Lord do that to us if we're really listening? And the tragedy of this story is the man becomes downfallen and he walks away broken because he couldn't do it. And a lot of people focus on, you know, because the guy was, he, he was more connected to his money than he was to following Jesus. And, and that's true. But I think the bigger tragedy is the guy missed out on the benefit of what would have happened if he would have done it. You see, that, that's what happens when we talk about answering the cry of the orphans. A lot of people go, oh, I'm too busy. You know, we, we just can't do that. Or, you know, I've raised my kids. And, dude, I was 50 years old when we adopted Gracie. And, and some people say, you know, I don't, we just don't have the money. And we just can't do this. But when we look at things in a short-sighted way like that, we're missing the bigger picture. And the bigger picture Jesus says, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's it. The kingdom of heaven. This is what it's all about. He says, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. He's telling his disciples, this guy missed the kingdom. This was his opportunity to step into it. And when we respond to the needs of these kids, all of a sudden we step into a new realm of the kingdom that we would never experience until we do this. And that's what Jane and I have experienced. We have seen glimpses and just pictures of the kingdom in a whole new way that has transformed our lives. I have seen a picture of God's grace and God's holiness through these girls in a way that I never would have experienced unless we have done this. There are so many blessings that are out there. You know, I, I know that most of us are just futurists, that we say, okay, I give this little now, and then God's going to reward me in heaven. And you know what? Jane and I are banking on that, baby. Because we go, this better pay off in the end. (laughs) But Jesus said to them later, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is talking to the 12 disciples. And everyone who has left houses, our brothers, our sisters, our father, our mother, our wife, our children, our fields, For whose sake? For his sake, our children, for his sake, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. I believe that that inheritance begins today. That we step into the kingdom today when we respond to these things. And we don't wait till we get to heaven. And it's, it's when we follow Jesus and we respond in obedience to his call, he goes, okay. Now let me show you what I'm talking about. But until we respond, he can't reveal those things to us. You understand his principle? And so Frank Laubach, he he nailed this in response to this parable. And he says, the rich man had the opportunity of paying a sacrifice which will cut his heart almost out. How many of us need our heart cut out? That There's things in our heart that the Lord's saying, you know, We need to kind of take that out because it's blocking you from seeing me. And he says, if he seeks the place where his wealth is needed most, then throws all he has into that cause and then throws himself into the cause with his money, his money will at that moment be transmitted into the golden threads of heaven. And when I read that, I said, this guy's got it. And so when we respond to the needs of these orphans, and sometimes it does take money on our part, that God blesses so we can bless others, right? Then the threads of heaven begin to intertwine with the pieces of our heart, and we begin to see things and experience things of the kingdom that we wouldn't experience any other way. And the reason I'm so passionate about it is because that's what Jane and I have experienced. 
Has it been hard? Oh my gosh. Let me tell you. But I can tell you, this, this is a cool thing. I was sick last week. And not that that was cool. I mean, I felt like I got run over by a Mack truck. The stomach thing that was going around and you get a little feverish. And so Gertie comes home from school and she comes into the room and she goes, how are you doing, Daddy? I said, oh, I don't feel good, Gertie. She goes, you look awful. <laughs> but you know what she did? She came up and she starts rubbing my shoulders. And then she goes, just a minute, Daddy. And she goes out and she gets a, a towel, a little hand towel, and she puts cold water on it and she puts it on my forehead. She goes, Dad, I'd make you feel better, Dad. She would have never done that eight, weeks, eight months ago before we started this program. She's really learning to receive love and give love. It's been worth it. You see? So, but the one thing I want you to know is these families that have adopted and families that are going to adopt, they need you. We as a church need to surround these kids with the support they need. And I'll get into exactly what that's going to look like for us. And I want you to see this video because this video really does tell us and help us to understand the impact that a church together can have in providing the needs to these kids. Let's watch this video. She was abandoned because she wasn't able to drink milk. And one of the things I was doing was painting the memorial garden of all the babies who had come through there but didn't make it. And they said, this little girl's probably not going to make it. The human part of me was scared and wanted to say, oh, whoa, this is way too much. Just, you know, holding his hands up to you, like, you know, love me, hold me. And just knowing, like, that's the face of Jesus. If you fall down, no one's going to kiss your little knee. You know, you just got to stand up and keep on going. We may think we have little to offer, but we serve a God who is capable of multiplying our efforts in ways we can't even begin to imagine. Those are 900 faces, and those are 900 kids that have individual stories. Those are 900 sets of parents that have abandoned their kids. They're real faces with real personalities. I thought that somehow in my little child thinking that I had wished it on her because I wanted so badly to be rescued from the situation that we were in. And it seemed like that was the only way out. I think as a single mom, she was thinking I made a mistake and God makes no mistakes and he is not a mistake. I just couldn't believe that one church could make a difference in the lives of Colorado's kids. And so she asked Ray and I to help her raise this baby. I felt like that that was God asking me to help him help her. People always think that you have to go over to China or Peru or Haiti and hold these cute little orphans, um, and that's all that orphans are. Um, they don't realize that there are orphans right here in our community that we can care for and that we can love on them and that we can show God's love to. But I've never, ever had a thousand people come to get for my kids. Never. Okay, so here's some very practical things that, that we can do in response to this. Obviously, the first thing is that it's very possible that the Spirit of God is, is tugging on your heart right now. And he's saying, I want you to become a foster parent, or I want you to look into adoption. And I want you to know that our Wovens Family Ministry is here to support you and walk with you through the process, because it can be a long uh, very enduring kind of a process. And there are various agencies in the back of the room that are helping people to adopt. And so if that's you, that's the first and foremost thing. The second thing is with what we found with these families is they need help and that have already adopted, especially these, these ones that have adopted kids that have these attachment issues. And to be able to bring them to healing, these kids to healing, we, we need your services around these kids. And one of the biggest things we found is the need for respite care. And what respite care means is these are people that are trained to work with these kids and keeping with the same program that these kids are, are having in the home and 
you give the parents a break. It can be a couple hours a month that you'll take one of these kids in so that the, the mom or the mom and dad can go have a date or, or just get away for a little bit so that they can get renewed and refreshed. We need people to do that. So there is a, uh, out in the, in the uh, atrium uh, some people that can talk to you about doing respite care. Another thing that we've seen is a lot of these families, because they're, they're so invested in helping the, the kids that they have, that they, they're just practical things around the home that, that they need help with. And so there's a helps in need desk that they have a list of little projects that your small group could do together or you could do with your family. You just go over the home and, and do some help around the house. And so you could, you could look at that. And uh, the other thing that we've seen is that um, it's, it's expensive to do this post adoption kind of services like the attachment therapy is very expensive and some of these families really need help with that and so the, the woven families team came up with this great idea of they have these baby bottles this isn't a baby bottle but just envision this a baby bottle and you can grab them when you leave here and and just take it home and every day just kind of empty your pocket of loose change and put it in that baby bottle and when that baby bottle is filled up just bring it to the church, and they'll put it into the account that's for the Woven Families Ministries to assist these families that are need, needing therapy and, uh, and other kinds of needs. And their goal through these baby bottles is they want to raise $20,000. And so we'll have a baby bottle out there, uh, a board that will kind of keep a log of how much money we're raising and, and able to give out to these families. So... Uh, the other thing is that uh, maybe some of you could do tutoring with these kids. Gr Gritty had a lot of real uh, educational issues because she, she had to learn the language and, and she didn't have much school. And so Muriel Morley, God bless this woman. She's like Mother Teresa in Grand Junction, that she just loves Gertie. And she, last two summers, has tutored Gertie for uh, three to six hours a week during the summer so that Gertie can continue to move forward in her educational process and has really helped Gertie through that. Um, the other thing is that Stephen Curtis Chapman, I really loved what they've done with their, uh, their uh, foundation called Show Hope, is now you can sponsor an orphan kid around the world in various orphanages by giving a little a month and you are helping that kid get medical care, food, education, and shelter. And you can be a big part of bringing that kid what they need so that they can grow up and be productive in their communities. So Show Hope is actually back there, and you can go to that booth and get information about that. So those, those are the practical things. And uh, if the Holy Spirit is, is working on your heart during the worship, you were given a brochure about our Woven Families Ministry. And by the way, those are pictures of our kids that have been adopted on that brochure, some of them. And there's a form in there that you can fill out, and they have all the different ways you can get involved and fill that out and give it to the, the ushers as you leave here so that they, the Woven Families Ministry can have uh, information about you on that. But again, this is as the Holy Spirit tugs on your heart of responding to the cry of these orphans. And as we respond to this, I pray that the kingdom would come into your lives and open your heart in a profound way. So let's stand together as we worship together in response to God's heart for these precious children around the world.
So the other day, I'm sitting at our dining room table, and I'm just reading, and uh, unprovoked, Gracie, bless her heart, she just walks up to me, and she wraps her arms around me, and she goes, I really love you, Daddy. You know what that does to a guy's heart? Hey, get away from me, I'm reading. <laughs> Golly, I saw the kingdom. I want you guys to experience the same thing. You can experience it through Gracie. You can experience it through Gertie as, as you support these other folks. But maybe God's saying to you, I want you to go get one. And so if any of you are feeling this calling that God's touching your heart, I think I might need to adopt. I think God's calling me. I want to call you forward because I, I think you need prayer. I really do, because this, this has got to be a God thing. And, and we have the ministry team here, and they would love to pray for you. The rest of you can go out and, and check the other booths, and you can pick up your bottles. You guys, let's be a church that's transformational, transformational around the world and changing the lives of these children. God bless you. You guys are amazing. Go Broncos. Have a great week.